For the second part of this series on intracranial infections, we're going to talk about diffuse infections. We already talked about general principles. This is going to be video number two, diffuse infections. The later videos in this series will talk about focal infections, special considerations in immunocompromised patients, and a few other considerations. For diffuse infections, there are a couple of major considerations that you think about in the brain. Those three main things are meningitis, encephalitis, and ventriculitis. So we'll talk about these one at a time and uh, go through some of the key features of each. So meningitis is an infection of the meninges or subarachnoid space. The clinical symptoms of meningitis are fever, white blood cell count, neck stiffness, and headache. Many times people will have altered mental status or alterations in behavior. The etiology of meningitis can be bacterial. The most common is going to be viruses and fungi and tuberculosis can also cause meningitis. You can have spontaneous meningitis or you can have iatrogenic meningitis after a surgical procedure. The most common imaging finding you're going to see in meningitis is going to be just a normal brain. When you do have imaging findings, here are some of the things that you're going to see. So this is uh, flare imaging, these two left images here. And what you're seeing is incomplete suppression of the flare. So if you take a look at the sulci over the convexity, uh, you have lo loss of the normal flare suppression there. So there should be no signal there on flare imaging. But in fact, it's filled with hyperintense material. Similarly, you see hyperintense material in the basal cisterns and again, some extraaxial material here. So this is a person who had uh, iatrogenic meningitis. On post-contrast imaging, which you see on the right here, you see leptomeningeal enhancement. So you see enhancement of the surfaces of the brain. So around the midbrain here, along the quadrigeminal plate cistern, you also see some scattered leptomeningeal enhancement uh, around here. So that's the typical imaging findings you're going to see in meningitis. Now, when you have meningitis, you can sometimes get complications. And this example shows uh, complications from meningitis. What you see on flare is you see abnormal flare in the insula and periinsular white matter. And on diffusion, it's hyper intense, and that's compatible with an infarct. On the MRA of the region, what you're going to see is a paucity of vessels in that MCA distribution and areas of vascular narrowing, which are due to irritation because of material in the meninges. This is a patient who had streptococcus angiosus endocarditis, so they were getting vascular occlusions in the setting of meningitis. Another complication you can get from meningitis is an abscess. So this is the same patient. One month later, you see increasing flare in that area. And on post-contrast imaging, what has happened is there's been development of a rim-enhancing collection there, which centrally has hyperintensity on diffusion-weighted imaging, and that's now an abscess. So there's essentially been a septic emboli, which has formed into a focal abscess there. So that can also be a complication of meningitis. Additionally, a complication of meningitis is ventriculitis. So when you have pus spilling into the ventricle, uh, so here you have some material collecting in the dependent portions of the ventricle on flare here. So you see non-suppression, both in the right occipital and left occipital horns. On diffusion, you see again, that material is hyper intense. You see maybe a little bit of material in the cilian fissure there. And then on post-contrast imaging, what you'll see is enhancement of the rim of the ventricle, so a little thin rim of enhancement. So this is a patient who had encephalopathy after spine surgery, got infection after the surgery, which ultimately spread to the brain and resulted in a ventriculitis uh, and meningitis. Ventriculitis is a severe complication of meningitis and can be, uh, has a very high morbidity and mortality. Now, basilar meningitis is a special subset of meningitis, which is centered around the basal cisterns and in the cilian fissures. The reason it's special is because it has a little bit of a different differential. And you can certainly see it with run-of-the-mill bacterial meningitis. But you, when you see it, you do have to think of other things, such as tuberculosis, fungal meningitis, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis from intracranial carcinomatosis, or sarcoid. I mean, these are all things that can cause a basilar meningitis. And so when you see that, you have to think of these alternate differential considerations. This is a case of basilar meningitis. So similar to the other case, you see a lot of abnormal flare in the ambient cistern, the quadrigeminal plate cistern, and a lot of uh, abnormal flare in the surrounding uh, tissue in the medial temporal lobe and around the ventricle here. On post-contrast imaging, you see this is a lot of enhancement here, enhancement of the superior cerebellar folia there. 
And uh, so that's a special subset of uh, meningitis that you'd think is basilar meningitis. You have to think of those other considerations. Uh, so you see some arrows denoting the findings there. Uh, this person went on to have infarcts. And so you see on diffusion, there's a lot of infarcted tissue in the superior cerebellum, the medial temporal lobe, and the thalamus there. You can see the left PCA is occluded there, so you're not seeing any PCA. Uh, this patient had a mold infection related to the hip prosthesis, and this uh, was a fatal condition for this patient. A similar example is uh, sort of a bifrontal example here. On flare, you see diffuse flare abnormality of the frontal lobes, a little bit worse on the right. On post-contrast imaging, you see avid enhancement, some of which includes the leptomeningeal spaces, some of which is in the parenchyma. On the coronal post-contrast image, you can see a little bit better that there's leptomeningeal involvement. So you have enhancement along these sulci. So kind of a salsiform enhancement, uh, sort of interdigitating into all of those sulci, along with some parenchymal nodules. This is a 32-year-old who had visual changes and altered mental status. They had a questionable history of meningitis that had been treated with eight weeks of antibiotics. Uh, this person ended up having sarcoidosis, which was confirmed on a right hilar biopsy. So a biopsy of lung nodes. So sarcoidosis can have a similar appearance. This is one of the more severe cases which I've ever seen. Uh, here you have another basilar meningitis. Uh, here, if you see on the axial post-contrast images, very thin leptomeningeal enhancement along the folia of the cerebellum. This is confirmed on the sagittal imaging. You see enhancement in the interpeduncular cistern along the surface of the pons here, also coating the superior surfaces of the cerebellum. Here you see it confirmed on the coronal imaging. You also have a nodule up here in the parenchyma. This is a 45-year-old with headache who turned out to have breast cancer. So this was leptomeningeal carcinomatosis from intracranial metastatic disease. In summary, on meningitis, your imaging findings can often be normal, but the key findings you're looking for are flare non-suppression and leptomeningeal enhancement. You can get complications of meningitis, which include infarct, abscess, and ventriculitis. Basilar meningitis is a special subset in which you have to think about a broader differential, including TB, fungus, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis, and sarcoid. Now, a second form of diffuse infection that you can get in the brain is encephalitis. It's similar to meningitis, only the infection or inflammation is focused on the brain parenchyma. If this is involving the cerebellar hemispheres, it's a cerebritis. If it involves the cerebellum, it's a cerebellitis. Uh, similar to meningitis, the causes are viruses, inflammatory or bacterial. Probably the vast majority are viruses or inflammatory. Bacterial encephalitis is much more rare. Again, it can be a complication of meningitis. So this is often overlapping conditions because you have involvement of the brain parenchyma. On imaging, similar to meningitis, you can see flare hyperintensity, but again, it will be centered in the brain parenchyma. You may or may not have enhancement. Now, there are some special causes of encephalitis that you should keep in mind. Highlighted here is herpes. That's the main one you want to think about is HSV, but a number of other viruses, including West Nile, St. Louis encephalitis, and a number of others can cause encephalitis. So think about those if you see an encephalitis. Uh, so this is an example of a 35-year-old woman with altered mental status. The CT findings are somewhat subtle maybe a little bit of hypodensity in the left medial temporal lobe there. You see it a little bit better on the coronal. So we're going to go ahead and see her MRI. Here you see on diffusion, the diffusion is relatively normal, not a whole lot going on there, but on both flare and T2, you have some hyperintensity there. The medial temporal lobe is a common location for encephalitis. It particularly should make you think about herpes when you have involvement of the medial temporal lobes. So these patients need to be treated with a cyclovir and antiviral medications uh, immediately. If you go on to see the post-contrast, however, this is not a whole lot of enhancement here. This is pre-contrast and then this is post-contrast. Not a lot of enhancement there. Uh, this ends up being a VZV or EBV encephalitis. So it's a viral encephalitis non-herpes. Uh, herpes encephalitis tends to be mo much more aggressive and to have a greater degree of enhancement. So here's an example of herpes. So you have T2. Again, T2 hyperintensity in the medial temporal lobe. Going to the temporal pole here. Unlike the previous example, this one happens to be quite bright on diffusion. Here's your flare showing hyperintensity along the sylvian fissure here, predominantly in the medial temporal pole. 
This was a 46 year old woman who had a trip like illness and was having headache and behavioral changes. Now, unlike the prior example, there's a great deal of enhancement. So on T1 pre, there's a little bit of intrinsic hyperintensity there, perhaps a little blood products, but on post-contrast imaging, there's very avid enhancement along the cortex and white matter of the temporal pole. You also see enhancement along the uh, insula and in the sort of deep white matter of the bilateral hemispheres. So very uh, avid enhancement. Uh, this one had CSF positive for herpes. So herpes, as I mentioned, is a viral encephalitis. You typically have involvement of the medial temporal lobes. It's probably slightly more common to have unilateral involvement or asymmetric involvement, although it can be bilateral. In the active stage, it usually enhances very avidly, although if, depending on the phase in which you catch it, you may not see enhancement. You need to have urgent treatment with acyclovir, even if you're not able to prove it by LP. The morbidity and mortality of herpes encephalitis is quite high. Uh, this is a five-year follow-up on that previous patient. You see a ton of encephalomalacia and volume loss there. Uh, the brain parenchyma off that temporal lobe was essentially uh, completely lost, and this patient continued to have seizure memory problems, so very high morbidity for that patient. This is an example of a similar uh, condition. So this is a limbic encephalitis, so it's an inflammatory encephalitis. This is a 30-year-old man with seizure and altered mental status on flare, bilateral involvement of the medial temporal lobes here, uh, T2 hyperintense on the middle images here, and on post-contrast imaging, very little, if any, enhancement. Uh, this person had an inflammatory or an antibody autoimmune encephalitis with anti-GAD antibodies. So limbic encephalitis uh, is another cause of encephalitis, which is not uh, due to any infectious agent. So in summary, encephalitis, you have parenchymal flare abnormalities. The temporal lobe is a favorite area. You may or may not have enhancement. Uh, viruses are the most common causes, and of those, herpes is the sort of most nefarious that you need to be worried about. In terms of inflammatory mimics, limbic encephalitis or an autoimmune encephalitis can have a similar appearance. The final diffuse infection we're going to talk about is ventriculitis. Now, we saw a case of ventriculitis earlier, but in ventriculitis is an infection in extending into or involving the ventricles. Now you have sort of two types. One would be an infection confined to the ventricles, or the second would be a secondary ventriculitis from spread of meningitis or abscess from the parenchyma. Uh, the primary ones tend to be viral, where the, whereas you have CMV or uh, VZV. And what you'll see is involvement of the ventricular margins. So here uh, we have a 55-year-old with headache and HIV. Uh, the CD4 count is 9, so a very low CD4. And what you see on diffusion is hyperintensity around the ventricles, some material layering in the dependent portions of the ventricles, not a whole lot of involvement of the parenchyma on flare, and maybe just a little minimal wisp of enhancement around the margins of the ventricles. But this person had a CSF which was positive for VZV. Thanks for checking out this video. The next video is going to talk about focal infection, where we'll talk about some more uh, focal infections within the brain.